Welcome to the Cloud Accounting Podcast. I'm Blake Oliver. And I'm David Leary. David, you're back from a trip to New York City. What were you doing in New York? I was freezing. Um, 30 <laughs> degree temperatures the whole time. <laughs> But no, I, I was there for uh, it was a uh, an event that AICPA and CPA and CPA.com put on. It's an executive roundtable. And what they basically do is they're really trying to get the apps to have conversations with accountants to some extent. And so 40 apps all go. They have some pe- members of the media there. There's obviously members of the AICPA there. They do a uh, couple panels. There's like a panel of uh, big firms. There's mm-hmm. a panel of small, medium firms. They brought in... Uh, couple of keynote speakers. One was a Microsoft architect that was all about, he's like the voice API architect. And then they had another uh, keynote and he was a futurist and talked about like, and this exponential uh, happening. So if you think about like where voice is at today, Mm -hmm. eight years from now, it doesn't go up like, oh, eight years later, we'll multiply it two times eight. It'll be twice as good, right? It's 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 exponential. Everything's exponential. So whatever your Alexa is doing today, Mm -hmm. it's going to be whatever, uh, eight to the 29th factorial, whatever, whatever he said in there, right? Exponentially better. Hmm. Um, and there's then there's nothing in history that doesn't show this is not true. And so they put together an event. It's really spark conversations, spark thought processes. Um, a couple of news things came out of there. I don't know. Should we jump in? I don't What, what yeah. did you do all week? So I was here in Los Angeles following along on Twitter, the hashtag AICPA Roundtable 2019. And I, I saw uh, Daniel Hood, the editor of Accounting Today, post something that was, is it Barry Mellencon, Mellencon said? He's the current president, correct? Yeah, he's the president and CEO at the AICPA and the CEO of the Association of International Certified Professional Accountants. Uh, and he said, according to Daniel Hood, only about 22% of partners are women. We need to do better on that front. And then Patty Scharf responded to that tweet and said, out of curiosity, what percentage of attendees are women at the AICPA roundtable? And uh, Dan's rough guess was about five to 10 percent. So a little ironic, right, that women are underrepresented in the room. And meanwhile, there's talk about how there aren't enough female partners in accounting firms. In the industry. Right. Yeah. And and if you don't fix the room first, right, then how's it going to trickle down? That's a very, very good point. Yeah. Obviously, it was my first time there. I've never been. Have you ever been there, Blake, to the AICPA? No, no, not this round too. Okay. No. But I mean, you walk into the front office and like these two huge paintings in like, they're like, phys- they're paintings, like the old like Rockefeller style, like industry Titan type paintings, mm-hmm. right? And so like, oh, so the, there's the, a lot of- The headshots, right? Of the former presidents or whatever? No, the, yeah. the bus. This is just the two paintings of like the bus of like the former, and then there was a bunch of headshots, right? Uh-huh. You know, we, I think we're talking about technical debt like mm-hmm. the apps have, right? It's kind of that like same type of thing where like, they just have a lot of history that it's going to take a while for things to finish, like to steer that ship different. Mm-hmm. But it's definitely has a history of just being Anglo-Saxons, yeah. male Anglo-Saxons and that yeah. forever. I mean, I couldn't believe that wall of headshots. It just <laughs> went on forever. And so it's going to, but the way it's going to happen is I think people like Patty and, and females really speaking up again about that because there, well, there was definitely females there, but you're right. From a percentage perspective, there wasn't as much. And then I'm used to going to some of these bookkeeping events, um, like the Scaling New Heights and things like that. And it's the ratio is maybe 60% female, yeah. 70% female. And so you're right. This doesn't, to me, it just doesn't feel like it represents the space yeah. a little bit. And hopefully that changes as, as, as it goes forward. Yeah. And I think to be clear, this wasn't an AICPA, this wasn't a gathering of CPAs. Uh, it was a gathering of, tech people serving the accounting community. But we should note that the d- the diversity problem is even worse in tech. If you look at California technology companies, something like only 15% of board members are women, which is even worse than the partners in accounting firms yep. situation. And it is crazy to think that a majority of accountants these days are women in firms, and a majority of the people becoming CPAs are women studying accounting, becoming accountants are women and yet they continue to be underrepresented it's it's a problem and and somebody you know the people organizing these events i think really need to make an effort i would say to to be more inclusive it's encouraging to me that like you said at a lot of these events for bookkeeping for uh, small businesses for solo accountants that women are very highly represented and that means to me they're the ones who are you know being more tech forward and and taking advantage of all this technology because they're they're more agile, right? And they are they they have to if they want to have a competitive advantage. 
Yeah. And so the, they brought 40 apps there. And when I say apps, I mean, it's Intuit, Sage. Um, I went on behalf of Auto Entry, right? But you're right. Like from a technology standpoint, right? And startup standpoint, there's a lack of females in that. So that just multiplies this and makes it worse. But I should call out though, like, if I remember correctly, the latest stats I saw at Intuit, I think Intuit has the highest ratio of female engineers versus any other company in the Bay Area. Maybe that's why they're doing so well right now. So. Yeah. You know? <laughs> that's going to be the secret. This is the word out. Yes. I, well, I read, I read another article recently. I don't know if I can find it. Something like um, uh, financial managers who are women outperform men by almost 2%, which is kind of, that's a huge amount, right? If you compound that year after year. So um, I don't know. I mean, we're not exactly helping, David. It's just you, you and me, two guys on a podcast. Like, how are we improving representation? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I, and I have a daughter. I'm, I'm always, I'm super conscious about this. Um, and, and when I did panels at um, some of the other, every time I do panels, I've always gone on my way to make sure um, to to make sure it's representative of the audience that's going to be at these events. So it's a, I don't have the magic wand. It's just, it's, it's something that, not talking about it isn't the right thing to do, right? Right, so. right. Let's get to the the news of the week. We haven't talked for a week about the shutdown. The shutdown is still on. Last time I checked, right? It hasn't ended yet? No? Yeah, you're, you want to jump right into the shutdown? We can do that. I was going to have a little one more piece of the news that broke at the oh, conference. Okay, well, why don't we, let's talk about that first. We can talk about that, yeah. So uh, an app, another app is going to run... A, a Super Bowl ad. So yes, Intuit's going to run Super Bowl ads, but an app's going to run a Super Bowl ad. So, so Intuit has been doing Super Bowl ads for a long time, right? Years. Especially TurboTax. Yes. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. That's a big thing. So, so, but we've never had another accounting app do a Super Bowl ad. So what is it? It is Expensify. Expensify. They're going to do a Super Bowl ad. Wow. On an expense, uh, a Super Bowl ad about expense reports. I'm excited. Like this to me is Cloud Accounting 2.0, David, when we have two companies doing Super Bowl ads in our space. It's exciting. Yeah, and hopefully it's 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 it keeps going, right? Because we don't want it to be like Web 1.0, yeah. you know, where it's it, it's it's uh, whatever that web van thing was, the sock puppet, pets dot com. Oh yeah, hopefully this won't be the end, the beginning of the end. Yes, uh, the beginning of the end. But it's exciting because, like, yeah, a, a, an app, and 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 I met Dave Barrett and the founder of uh, Expensify nine years ago when I was working on View My Paycheck. So like, to watch somebody go from a teeny 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 teeny, teeny baby startup all the way to having Super Bowl ad is like really awesome. It's cool. It's exciting. It's good for the industry. It's good for the space. Yeah, I've been using, I, I went back in my emails to see when I signed up for Expensify and it was 2012 in the summer. So I, it, it hasn't been that long really. And I'm not surprised that Expensify is the app that is doing this because they like to apparently blow their entire marketing budget on one big thing every year. In the, in the past, it's been uh, their Expensicon retreat that they do for a select group of accountants and uh, so-called influencers. Um, I got to go to one of them. They didn't invite me back for for another. But <laughs> I, I remember uh, at scaling, um, the SleaterCon. So this is, and this is going back 2007, uh -huh. maybe 2008, you know, so a long time. And this is when a few of my paycheck won an award there. And I think they got an award for something as well. Like, so we're both there. But that was like the first year Concur started to come into the space, the small business space. And so Concur showed up with a motorcycle. They rode a motorcycle into the show floor. Like this <laughs> $100,000 Harley Davidson custom chopper thing, right? They all had these crazy leather coat jackets on, all this like over the top stuff. None of them actually work for Concur. It's just a marketing company. Mm -hmm. So you couldn't even ask them about the app. In the meantime, while well, Dave's just standing in this teeny booth, you know, uh, talking to people one at a time, telling them about his expense app. But I remember Dave just speak. Those guys are so dumb. They're just blowing all this money. And now he's running a Super Bowl ad. I just find that <laughs> kind of amazing. I love it. I love it. Well, uh, so let's let's now let's go to real news. Then. Real news away from the fantasy world of Super Bowl ads and marketing. Um, the shutdown is continued. It is January eighteenth today as we record this, and the shutdown is still going. What does this mean for accountants? What does this mean for tax season, David? I think the last time we talked about this two weeks ago, the uh, IRS was like, we're not even up in our Twitter page. Like, they were, like only 12% of the staff is working, something like that. So they've announced now they have a plan. They have an updated shutdown contingency plan. Mm -hmm. And part of that plan is they are going to um, have 46,000 of its 80,000 employees coming back to work. Are they getting paid or are they just working unpaid? Uh, it looks like they're working unpaid. Okay, so they'll be really happy. Yeah, another part of it. So this article was in uh, Accounting Today. Um, the the real thing that's a little scary about this is they're going to be operating at about 57% staff, 
using new newly updated systems because they had to update them from the crashes last year. Mm-hmm. And they're using new forms. Wow. Probably the most tax law changes that have happened in maybe a decade. How do you think this is going to work? <laughs> it's going to be a disaster. Yeah, I, I think there's expectations they've called out here. Uh, minimal customer service, slower refunds, uh, technical mishaps are going to happen, and no paychecks for now. The interesting thing is they they referenced the TSA. So apparently a lot of TSA workers are currently calling, they're kind of calling in sick a lot. Yeah, they're calling in sick to protest because they're being forced to work without pay, which I didn't yes. even know this. I didn't even realize this was possible. Like, how is it legal for the federal government to force people to work without pay? Like, like oh you're oh because your only option is to quit your job like so you have the option to quit your job or work without pay <laughs> I, I don't know how, how how they can do this <sighs> um, but like what what happens if you know ten percent of those people all start calling sick right yeah you know what what if they come in right these IRS agents they come in the computer system's a pain in the butt it's not working very reliably they're not being paid all these tax law changes are a mess they have queues. Hours and hours, and hours of phone calls backed up of people calling in for help. I would probably call in sick. Mm-hmm. Like, who wants to deal with that? <laughs> like, you're not being paid. Like, 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 you would just be like, forget it. I'm going home. Oh, so yeah. It's gonna be, it's gonna be an interesting thing to keep watching every day. Like, at this point, I wonder if the IRS is gonna fall behind and not be able to catch up. I don't know. Well, are, they, like, are they gonna extend the deadline? Like, should we bet on that? The over under on that? I mean, I. I I, th- I don't think they will extend the filing deadline. It's just that people will have to file and then amend if they if something changes, right? As Americans, we should just protest to not pay our because taxes. Nobody should pay their taxes this year. <laughs> That'll fix these problems right well, away. <laughs> speaking of taxes, there is a new ninety nine dollar tax service for the masses. I'm sure you haven't seen any of these pop up recently, right, David? Uh there's lots <laughs> of uh Flat rate, everything. Yeah. Well, so this is a startup called Visor, and I read about this in CPA Trendlines, which I have recently subscribed to, so I can actually read their articles and not get blocked by the paywall. So uh, I'll save you the trouble of having to subscribe and tell you about them. Uh, Visor, new $99 tax service. They just raised $9 million in financing. Uh, the goal is to make taxes as painless as possible. Now, this is nothing new. There are plenty of firms like this. What I did like about Visor, I took a look at their website, it's visor.com. They have a really nice, clean pricing model. So if you're looking at trying to come up with some simple pricing for your tax services or for your bookkeeping services, go to visor.com slash pricing. The way it works is uh, their base return is $99. And that's, of course, what is getting the headlines. But if you want any additional, you, you check a box on this calculator and it adds another $99 for each item you check. So if you're self-employed, add 99 bucks. If you sold stock, you have equity or crypto, it's another another $99. Rental income, another 99. K1 slash partnership income, you got it, 99 bucks. So if you check all those, it ends up coming to closer to 600 bucks. So it's good marketing, right? Because you can say, hey, get your tax return done for $99, and then people come to your site, and then it actually ends up being more, but... You know, it's very clear. They're not disappointed in any way. And it's a lot easier than, you know, pricing by the form or something that, that people don't understand. Right? I know exactly what I'm going to pay up front. And that's what consumers want. I mean, we've talked about this stuff before. Like people want to know, I know how much that coffee cup is going to cost me. I know how much that iPhone is going to cost me. Yeah. Before I, I want to know how much it's going to cost up front. And that's funny because these ads that you see from uh, TurboTax, that's what they're attacking. I, I I think it was TurboTax. I saw an ad where it's a, somebody uh, talking to their CPA and they're like, so um, you know, how much is this going to cost me? And the guy's like, mm, well, uh, basically not not you're not able to tell them what it's going to cost until you've done the return, right? And and the yeah. guy ends up it looks leaving. Like they, they've rolled in like any e-file cost and stuff in there. Whoa, what was that well. sound? I, I, I bumped the mic <laughs> stand, sorry. It, so a special it effect, like everybody. Gone. Hopefully... <laughs> this story's done. We got right. it. What's next, David? It. <laughs> They're doing, you know, tax returns out of the box. Well, you're starting to see people do a lot of this uh, bookkeeping out of the box, flat fixed fee bookkeeping, kind of really going for that self-employed play. And there's a lot of companies that's popped up that are doing this, right? So you got the uh, the scale factors, you have the bench. Um, mm-hmm. These accounting firms, they're, they're 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 basically accounting firms with engineers. This is from a article from Xconomy. Dot com at scale factor adds thirty million dollars um, in VC, they got uh, thirty million dollar uh, VC money to boost their accounting software. 
So if you think about that, this is an accounting firm taking on thirty million dollars. So tell me about money. Scale Factor. What 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 are they? So if I'm a small business owner, I, I could outsource all my bookkeeping to Scale Factor. So instead of having an in-house bookkeeper, so, okay. I could I could hire a cloud accountant bookkeeper to do my they're, stuff. They're a cast firm. They are, they are in a way, right? But they're coming off as a software play. Okay. Because do they? Right, right. You may never talk to a person. You might only interact uh, through the website. Do they have their own software? Is that what they do? They have some code. So I don't, I'm not positive about what they have or don't have. And that's the thing with a lot. Of, and this is why I said that the term that I'm using are they're accounting firms with okay. engineers. So yeah, I think of it as, you know, software plus a service. But I, yeah, I always have trouble figuring out, do they have their own accounting software or are they layering on top of QuickBooks? Do they have their own dashboard thing that they've created? Like, yeah, how much of it is automated and how much of it is just working with an outsourced firm? So the interesting thing about this, they've already taken funding before, but they won't say what they're going to use this money for. They, so it's, Scale Factor didn't say what features it's adding to the service, though they did announce they've hired a new chief technology officer. Mm -hmm. um, but then they, they've also moved to a new headquarters in Austin, and they said they're going to open four remote offices. Now, what I suspect that is, is these are four offices, maybe in India or the Philippines. It's that kind of that human powered AI. Mm -hmm that a lot of people are using. So I doubt they're opening four US offices. Mm -hmm. They're probably four remote. When they say remote, they're like, yeah, these are outsourced accounting offices. That's probably where a lot of this is happening. And so they're kind of, in a way, like that's this, a lot of this model, right? You you have an accounting office. It's, it's, it's really an right. outsourced accounting model, but you're putting like the software front end on it. So people just think they're just using something called scale factor and all the magic's happening, but there's still bookkeepers and accountants. And what, what, what I love about this from uh, an operations perspective and expectations perspective is that when people think they're interacting with software, they have much lower expectations of customer service. So you can get away with outsourcing because people don't expect you to make sense when you reply to them or to you know, get everything right. <laughs> yeah, one observation or a thought I had, so, so I read this when I was in the airplane, is I know there's a lot of people, a lot of small cloud-based accounting products, right? Like these guys, I'm, I don't, I don't know the founders of Scale Factor, but if I had to bet some money, they probably worked at one of the big fours. They probably were working at one of these partner model firms, mm -hmm. right? And the big problem, a lot of problem struggle people have with the partner model firms is once somebody's partner, they have opinions, they have equity, right? It's hard to make decisions. Etc. Well, if people didn't like that model. Well, if you're an accounting firm and now you're taking VC money, guess what happens the second you don't deliver the numbers you were promising? Yeah, they take over. They take over. And, and I imagine the VCs changing the direction of your company is maybe worse than having partners. We'll see where this goes, but we're in, there's a couple accounting firms with engineers, if you want to call them that. There's five, six, seven of them now that all exist, and they all have mm -hmm. investors that are straight up VC. So it's going to be really interesting where two years down the road, where people's opinions are uh, that have done this and taken this VC money like this at the, these huge rounds. Hmm. Yeah, interesting to see what will happen or interesting to wonder what will happen. I've got a story similar to this. Shoot. It's about an accounting firm, about outsourcing, about CAS. So this appeared in Accounting Today um, about 10 days ago. Uh, it's a it's an accounting firm merger announcement, which I normally just do not pay attention to because it's super boring. Uh, but this is this is actually the a partnership of uh, a traditional firm called Beach Fleischman PC and another small firm called GML CPA PLLC, and they have teamed up to create a virtual firm called Mod Ventures that will serve both firms outsourced accounting services clients going forward. So basically, it's a it's a top two hundred firm, Beach Fleischman, based out of Tucson, your your hometown, David. Yes, yes, both of these are spitting distance of me right now. So it looks like they've partnered up with uh, this smaller firm. I can, I don't, I'm not sure if they acquired it or whatnot, but they're rebranding it. Um, it's going to be called Mod Ventures. And I, the reason I bring this up is because it's an interesting way, an interesting approach for a large firm to adopt some of this modern workflow, cloud accounting. Uh, fixed fee pricing is mentioned extensively in the article. It's a way to adopt that under a new brand without forcing a bunch of change under the old brand with all those partners who are resistant to change, right? So it's it's like creating a startup firm inside of your firm where you can experiment. And if it works, that grows. Your traditional firm doesn't need to grow, right? You, you got your partners invested in that. They can just, that can just continue on. But all the growth can happen in the new brand. 
I, I really like that as a as a way to get the benefit of moving to modern accounting without the disadvantage of pissing off a bunch of partners who like things the way they are. I know a little bit of background story on this little bit. Um, I guess Beach Fleischman, they actually two, three years ago were like, oh, we're going to go cloud. We're going to do this. And they just couldn't get there. So acquiring somebody that already has a virtual firm, uh, acquiring, partnering, however, I don't know the details of the the deal, that's maybe their only way they could do it is you have to just <laughs> not do it, <laughs> right? Like in a way, right? Like, okay, fine. We're not going to do it. We're just going to yeah. figure well, out and, a way to Actually, uh, this reminds me now, as we're talking about it, of, of FreshBooks, what happened with FreshBooks. So there, there, there's a story. FreshBooks has been around for a long time in the space, like over 10 years, I want to say 15 years. Uh, was one of the first online invoicing tools for small business owners. Yep. And after about 10 years, they were having a lot of success, but the CEO there realized that the app was not catching up. Like they'd gotten too big and they weren't innovating and they kept trying to change the app uh, and improve it, but it kept failing because of all this, I don't know, I guess like technical debt. They had people were used to the way it worked. And so he had an innovative solution, which was uh, he gave up trying to change the current FreshBooks app he actually incorporated an entirely new company and t- sent like 20 of his best people into that company to work on a competitor to his own company. And they built FreshBooks 2.0, which was actually called something completely different. It had a different name and people didn't even know that it was owned by FreshBooks. And once they had built something that was better than FreshBooks, they basically just migrated uh, they renamed it FreshBooks, the the new app, and they migrated everyone over. They like built his own competitor. I mean, that's the the a lot of strategies. I mean, Amazon's always done stuff like that. Netflix, you have two engineering yeah. teams work on the same problem, and then you pick the winner. And a lot of people, I mean, I think Sony was historically was like that. You know, the whoever whatever they were working on the first floor, somebody was on the second floor building the next version of that, and the third floor, the next next version of that. So, so that's that's what I think accounting firms should do. If you're stuck and unable to change, and you keep failing with your uh, uh, modernization, like um, build your own competitor because you can't lose. That makes sense. You're just stealing business from yourself. Uh, I think I have a bunch of small articles after that. Nothing major, major. Did you have any like a big long one you want to jump into? I've got a story here about nurses that has something to do with accounting. Okay. So this is a Gallup poll. Uh, it's called nurses. Well, the article based on the poll is called nurses again, outpace other professions for honesty ethics posted by Gallup, uh, in December. So they do these annual surveys of, uh, what people's perceptions are of different professions, different jobs. And nurses came out again on top with 84% of people having a very high or high rating of honesty and ethical standards of nurses very high. Um, Medical doctors next, then pharmacists, high school teachers, police officers, and coming in one, two, three, four, five, sixth are accountants. So uh, 42% of Americans view accountants positively. Uh, 48% um, view them average. And then only seven, looks like seven to 10% have a, a low or no opinion of accountants. So uh, and right above funeral directors, we beat out, <laughs> we beat out fun- and we beat out clergy this year. So accountants, accountants are more respected than clergy. Take that to the bank. And every every industry is more respected than members of Congress. Like that's yeah, they, coming at the, the bottom. <laughs> that, that, that's the lowest. Have, yeah, they have like only eight percent positive, and fifty eight percent have a low opinion or very low opinion of them. Oh. Uh, along with car salespeople, have about the same. Telemarketers are down there too. Advertising practitioners and stockbrokers also not doing so good. Interestingly, business executives are very negatively viewed as our lawyers. I do have a theory though why accountants are, or high school teachers are higher than accountants. Why is that? Greg Kite used to be a high school teacher. Then he switched to become an accountant, and that probably like oh, that must have just dramatically you know, shifted. <laughs> yeah, shifted everything. <laughs> You'll have to let him know. <laughs> yeah, that he, that he's helping to uh, bring down the profession. Oh, this is kind of a good one. Uh, Google is raising the prices of their G Suite, whatever they're calling it now, um, their, G Suite. Their, their office pro- product, G Suite. Yeah. So that would be their Google Sheets, their Google Docs, their Google Email, that suite. So they're raising the price uh, 20%. I mean, it's still ridiculously cheap for what you get. How much is it now? 
these days? T- ten. It's bumping it from five dollars to six dollars a user per month. Yeah, I mean that's just insanely cheap for everything you get from it. I even think Microsoft Office, what you get in that Office three sixty five, is amazing for eight bucks a month. It's incredible. Like you, you, both services are a crazy amount of services you get for those prices. It's interesting though because the. Uh, the, the quote, which I just noticed here, is the 20% price increase comes soon after the appointment of Thomas Curian, a former Oracle executive. Oh, God. Oracle's ruining everything again. <laughs> so that was his first move. He came in. He's like, 20% up. Let's do this. I thought that was kind of an interesting move um, that he did that immediately. Yeah, that's such a that's such a like enterprise like you know, thing. Well, because now he took over a division. He's going to be able to claim, I raised the revenue in this division by 20%. Smart guy. Yeah. And he, he, so does it, I think the uh, other takeaway on this is because this happened at the AICPA roundtable. There's a discussion. Members of the AICPA, uh, um, the firms that were on the panels, all made comments that they're OK if apps raise prices. They actually want apps to raise prices. They want apps to make money. They want the vendors to make money mm-hmm. because they know that long term that helps everybody be successful. All they ask, though, is if you're going to raise prices, give everybody a 12 month notice. Right. Because now that you everybody's starting to go to fixed fees, flat fees, right? Value bill, you can't have this surprise of like, oh, you just raised the price of your app by 25%. Because now that means maybe some benefit I was going to give to my employees, I have to cut. Mm-hmm. I have to cut something somewhere. So it's okay to raise prices, but you got to give the accountants and the accounting firms a year notice. That makes sense. Hey, I spotted something on LinkedIn. Uh, so yeah, where's that? Will that's Farnell that's that. is the practice founder of Farnell Clark Limited in the UK. They are a firm based in Norfolk. And I think they have, it says they have 20 employees on LinkedIn. So he posted on LinkedIn a week ago, and this got like 506 likes, that their firm is getting rid of the 37.5 hour working week. I guess in the UK, they only work... 37.5 hours per week <laughs> instead of 40. They're getting rid of the 20 something days annual holiday entitlement. And of course, in the UK, they get, you know, what, four weeks off, right? Uh, and uh, they're getting rid of all of that. And in exchange for exceeding performance expectations and continuing to deliver great client expe- experiences, their team are going to be allowed to work when and where they want. Unlimited holiday, as long as the get- job gets done. And on days they work, it's going to be only six hours to fit around their personal life rather than 7.5 with some core hours in the office. So no more. uh, So six hour work days and unlimited paid time off. So it's kind of opposite of the article we saw last week with somebody who said remote working doesn't work. Right. Obviously, two people are going to attack two different firms are both going to attack their culture two different ways in 2019. We'll see how they both turn out at the end of the year. Well, and, you know, I'm building out a team here at Flowcast, and my personal goal is that we only work six hours a day. And I believe that if we are efficient and we get rid of the unnecessary meetings and we use collaboration software well, then we should be able to get the eight-hour day, the work in an eight-hour day done in six hours a day. And I don't plan on requiring any of my staff to come in uh, at any particular time. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll report. I might be working for Blake soon. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like a it's deal. completely results oriented. And, you know, to do that, of course, you've got to be able to track the results. So, you know, I'm building out uh, a way to track, you know, how many uh, articles are getting written, how many case studies are getting written, right? How, um, what, do, what do we deliver in terms of bylines and, uh, and one sheets and all that stuff that the company expects from us. And that's what they care about, not many, how many hours we worked. So it would be the same if I was working in an accounting firm. And well, actually, the reason I'm not working in an accounting firm right now is because they wouldn't let me do that. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm excited to see Will Farnell and his post and, and that there were 506 likes on it. That means there there's people that want this out in the world, right? Uh, and maybe more firms will move to the six-hour workday and the unlimited PTO. Yeah, it takes a lot of courage to do that. Um, yeah. I got to be willing to fail. So, and that ties into some stuff we talked about, you know, where... Uh, we are in the age where the employees kind of have some power because of the uh, shortages, right? Yeah. Um, and so this kind of ties it as well. Um, Bank of America announced, so this was on payments.com, P-Y-N-T-S, <laughs> Bank of America, the Zelle. So Zelle is that peer-to-peer payments app. I think a lot of people um, have use it. Uh, yeah, it's a lot the of consumers. B of A built it as a competitor to Venmo. 
Venmo and PayPal's, et cetera, right? Yeah. Uh, their transaction volume increased by 97% in Q4 on that. And what, what's happening though is, uh, so- this, I'm a, I use Zelle, by the way. Raise my hand here. Okay. So so during that quarter, they made 52 million payments worth 14 billion. So so it's really taken off. It has traction. But it all started to tie back. So what's happening is now customers. So if you follow this tie back to us, right? Consumers are now understanding they can transfer money instantly from one consumer to another consumer. So now, like, oh, I want to remember we talked about people getting paid instantly. Mm -hmm. So they're going to expect to be paid instantly. Right. But then they're also going to expect to pay for things instantly. They're going to expect to walk into a, a store or a restaurant and be like, can I just pay you a Zelle? So this is this, this instant payments just every week is start more and more of a, of a, a theme just keeps coming, it keeps coming, it keeps coming. But now like if the customer's expectations at a consumer level are this businesses have to catch up. This is, it's mm-hmm. here. It's already here. It's over. You know, you made a prediction that 2019 is the year of instant payments. I think it's coming true already, David. You might have to make another prediction or you'll another be... Another prediction? You'll... <laughs> I, I, I have a prediction. We could do that. I could go to my next article. You want me to do that? No, you save it for next week. Oh, uh, next week? All right. Yeah, I want to hear it next week. Okay. I've got a story here from the AICPA blog about the CPA license and evolving tech. It's called Evolving Tech Could Mean Evolving the CPA License by Susan S. Coffey. And she's a CPA, CGMA. And... She is leading an initiative from NASBA and the AICPA called CPA Evolution. And it is, quote, to explore ways to evolve CPA licensure to integrate technological and analytical expertise. The initiative formed a a task group or working group to examine college curricula, the uniform CPA exam, current experience requirements, and to figure out are these adequate for the new technology focus that accountants are being asked to have, that they're the knowledge they need to succeed. So I was excited to read this because I'm a, I'm an accountant, I'm a CPA who focuses on technology. And I think that the education I had and the, the exam and, and the experience requirements were totally inadequate for technology. It very, had very little to do with, with tech, if anything. So she's asking for feedback. So if you want to give feedback to this working group, they haven't made any conclusions yet, but it sounds like they might be on the right path. You should email Susan Coffey. She invited everyone to email her. It's susan.coffey, C-O-F-F-E-Y, at A-I-C-P-A hyphen C-I-M-A dot com. Uh, it's very impressive that she put her email address like that out there for people to give feedback. Uh-huh. Um, I imagine, and it just shows maybe the AICPA is evolving a little bit. Imagine well, five years ago they didn't do that. Yeah, I talked to somebody at a conference from the leadership. I can't, I can't remember who it was, but he said one of the problems they have is that the CPA exam sections are, are actually uh, in in the law in a lot of states. They're required by law, and so they can't just go and change the CPA exam and like get rid of sections or require that people not take certain sections because the tax section might be required by law in the state of I don't know Colorado in order for you to get your license. So they have to be very, they have to like play around with how they change the requirements on the exam for sure. Because uh, it's all state by state, right? <laughs> this is the problem with our country. And when you, know, when, you, when, you, when you have every state licensing CPAs, how do you get them all to change all at once? It's like trying to get an accounting firm with 50 partners to all agree on something. Yeah, but that's, the, but that's <laughs> what the AICPA is supposed to worry about. Like yeah, that's, that's their, their job. job right? That's yeah. their job. So they're thinking uh, they, they have problems to solve. We talked about in the beginning of the podcast, we talked about the diversity problems. Um, the, uh, you know, you were ta- you're talking about this now, the the technology and how it's going to mess- change the CPA license. They have issues with, you know, the globally, right? And that you have 50 states, but then you got all these other countries they're trying to uh, work through. So there's just a lot on their plate, yeah. um, including the shutdown. Like, I, I think there's impacts to the shutdown that the AICPA is, they have to go to Washington and talk to people sometimes. So, like, they're involved in that, too. So, they have their plate full. Well, you know, that's, I, I got more we could talk about, but I'm, I'd rather save it for next week. So, David, where should people go online to connect with you and tell you interesting things? Uh, you can track me down on Twitter, at David Leary. Also, you can track down the Cloud Accounting Podcast on Facebook, oh, yeah. just search for Cloud Accounting Podcast and you can become a fan. It would be exciting if we had some fans. Yes, and if you'd like to get in touch with me, you can head over to my website. It's blakeoliver.com. 
hit the subscribe button on my website and you will be notified of new podcast episodes. I will automatically email you the show notes. So you'll have all the articles that we discussed along with a summary of each article. And you can just click that in your email to read the full thing, which is really helpful, right, David? And so if if people want one of those six-hour day jobs you're, you're offering, mm-hmm. so should they <laughs> reply to your email and email you about that job or they should connect with you on Twitter? So if you, about- if you, work, uh, if you work in accounting or at an accounting app uh, uh, and you're interested in becoming a product marketing manager at Flowcast, get in touch with me because I'm hiring one. You only, and you only have to work six hours a day. I, I I, well, a- that's my commitment to you. But I mean, there are conditions. But if you, if, yeah, but uh, that's my goal is for everybody to work six hours a day uh, if we collaborate effectively using collaboration software and remote work and all that good stuff. Until next week, Blake, we'll uh, chat again soon. Great talking, David. Talk to you awesome. next Friday. All right. Bye, everybody.